Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us again at Digital Look TV in London. With us today is Joshua Mahoney. He is research analyst at Alpari UK. Joshua, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, hey, my pleasure. Let's see. This last Monday, Mohamed El Arya from PIMCO Asset Management wrote an article in the Financial Times, and he went through several risk factors which are affecting markets. Some of them might be the U.S. fiscal cliff, fears of Fed tapering risks in the Middle East, political doubts in the Eurozone, problems in Japan, the lack of a so-called third arrow of structural reforms. All these could bear down on markets in coming months. They could lead conceivably to a sharp market correction, in his opinion. Do you share that view? <clears throat> Would you stress any of these risk factors above all, all others or not? Yeah, I'd say my opinion personally is that, again, really we've got to stick to this Fed tapering. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when you look at the markets, we're at all-time highs with the likes of the S&P. Mm -hmm. And the core driver of that in particular isn't necessarily that we've got really strong economies out there because we don't. We're starting to see a pickup in that, yes. But okay. when you look at some of the companies, you know, a lot of it is driven by cost-cutting measures, a lot of mm -hmm. the uh, uh, better profits that we've been seeing in some of these companies, and not necessarily through actually you know, growing and in increasing the sales and top, capacity. Top line. Of, exactly. And so you know, as, as a result of that, you've got to look at what what the S&P would be should hmm. we not have any asset purchases currently in place. Okay. I think probably we'd have around about 20 to 30 percent off of where we currently are anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think the market's massively overinflated as a result of the quantitative easing program in the US. So once that does come to an end, I think yeah, really, you know, the market's not going to have this artificial booster that it currently has done recently. And I think we will have some sort of pretty significant correction. Um, you know, looking at some of the other events that you were talking about mm -hmm. previously, um, mm -hmm. with relation to the debt ceiling, yes. again, much of what we've seen previously, this came around at the back end of last year, and in January we saw it increase by 300 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't necessarily expect us to see um, that, that, you know, that will actually pass that threshold and that they'll start defaulting on any of their debts. Uh, mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that they, the US can actually print money, the Eurozone right. can't, so there is a very little chance that we might actually see a default within the US. So kick the can further down the road. Exactly. So, you know, you know, I just think a lot more brinkmanship is going to be the same old story. Mm -hmm. You know, Obama coming out with statements uh, that are tantamount to, you know, you signed off on these original bills, so now you have to, you know, uh, increase the debt limit to be able to pay them to Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, I think basically we're going to get a few more spending cuts put through and that's what Congress are going to want. Obama is probably going to you know, agree with it in the end because okay. it's for the, for the good of the economy, hmm. bearing in mind that we are constantly reaching this upper threshold of the debt limit. Hmm. And so really it's not necessarily a bad thing even if he does put through some of these spending cuts. I think it's a, necess a necessity really. Hmm. Um, and I don't think it's really going to have too much of a damaging effect to the markets. Um, in relation to Japan, mm -hmm. I think you know there are certainly worries over in Japan at the moment. Um, with regards to the third arrow, it seems like he thought through the first and the second, and when mm. he came to the third, he sort of s stumbled somewhat and, and still trying to work out exactly what it is. Now, um, you know, they've got pretty significant debt to GDP ratios over there, and they how do. they're going to address that is, is yet to be seen, but it's not really at the moment at the forefront of people's minds. Mm -hmm. I think we will see the likes of sales tax brought in soon enough, but the worry really within the Japanese region is whether they're going to go far enough to be able to implement measures such as the sales tax. But, you know, there was talk of potentially reducing the consumption tax to somewhat counterbalance it, okay. which makes me worry about the Japanese region because. In essence, that means that they're potentially not actually taking it as seriously as they should do. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly touching on the Middle East, as you were talking about previously, mm -hmm. there is a danger that this could go on for an extended period of time. Um, however, in the meanwhile, I think you know, it's, it's really at, at a peak, the tension that we are at the moment and the mm -hmm. anticipation of you know, potential strikes from the likes of the UK and the US. But in the medium term, uh, I think there's a lot of things that need to be worked out in the short term before we can actually see whether that's going to be impacting the, uh, the likes of the S&P um, mm -hmm. in the same way that I do expect there's almost certainty that we'll see an impact off of the uh, tapering in the okay. US. Going, uh, talking about the Middle East, uh, do you think that how dangerous is it really when we're looking out towards the medium term? Is it very dangerous or will it just blow over in a couple of weeks, months? 
I mean, I think it's very dangerous personally. Um, you know, you bear in mind some of the conflicts that have gone previously when you look at Libya. Uh, Libya had uh, massive oil supplies, so you know, you saw the shock to the price of Brent. Um, mm. When you look at the conflict in Egypt, that again, we saw a re response in the price of Brent, but that was largely owing to the fact that it's a major transport link with the Suez Canal. Mm. Now, what's interesting about the Syrian conflict is the fact that mm -hmm. it is a proxy for, uh, you know, the next world war. I don't want to necessarily, you know, scare people too much, but you're right. really pulling some of the major international players in. Uh, basing it around this very crucial country and you have the likes of Russia, potentially China and Iran on one side and you do have the West with the Euro Eurozone, some of the European countries, the UK mm -hmm. and the US on the other side. So, you know, I do think that the US is most likely, or the US and the UK, uh, are most likely to want to keep it very brief. Of mm -hmm. course, we know exactly what happened previously with Bush when he came into Iraq. Yes, we and, and you know, they said that there was WMDs and they didn't actually wait for a UN mandate. Mm. Now, there's this talk of the US, actually, I mean, the UN actually ratifying the fact that um, Assad has actually used chemical weapons. Okay. And that's why I don't think there's necessarily too much um, appetite within the likes of the UK and the US to go in before they actually do have that uh, ratification from the UN mm -hmm. because of the previous um, problems that have gone before. You know, we talk about the debt ceiling in the US. They don't mm. necessarily have the money to actually be paying for point. another war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they could go in there for one, two days, nip in, try and actually target some, some key, le key areas and then potentially maybe provide some more armaments to the uh, rebels within Syria. Mm. But apart from that, I think they'll try and keep it to a minimum. What we're really looking out for in the medium term is how are the likes of Iran and Russia going to respond to this? Mm -hmm. Of course, Iran has massive implications for the likes of Israel because mm -hmm. Israel was seen as a primary target for Dangerous. Iran. Mm -hmm. And also, when you look at some of the oil exports coming out of the likes of Kuwait and Qatar, yes. Iran, Iraq, it's all flowing through that Strait of Hormuz and that mm -hmm. is largely controlled by Iran. Mm -hmm. Now back in January they actually threatened previously to close that region so they know it's something that they can always sort of refer back to as a threat to the world. Mm -hmm. There's around about one-fifth of global oil supply comes through the state, Strait of Hormuz. Huge amount. So, so it is really, um, it's got the potential to have pretty significant consequences for okay. the global economy. As a worst case scenario, worst case how far could a spike in crude prices go? I mean, I don't see it to be unreasonable that we might see a move up towards 125, 150 at the, at the most. Okay. I mean, you know, it seems Quite crazy, right. but when we're talking about Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. we've got an ongoing conflict in Egypt and there's, there's no sign that there's an out within the, within the region. You know, mm. they have currently, they have the military keeping everything under wraps, so to speak. Mm. But there's no signs that the Muslim Brotherhood are actually going to find any of the, the proposals from the military, uh, you know, as something that they'd actually want to take on board in the long run. So I see the conflict within Egypt going mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's the, the threat to the Suez Canal in association with that. Huge and then, and then mm. when you bear in mind that simultaneously we might see Syria and Iran, and Iran cl closing off the Strait of Hormuz, mm. that's further pressure, upward pressure on the, the price of uh, Brent crude. So, you know, it's, it's got the potential to have some pretty significant consequences, both of these simultaneous conflicts out in the Middle East. Certainly very worrying news. Yeah. If we can go back just a little bit, please, uh, about Japan. You were telling us about Prime Minister Abe, he seems to be missing an arrow in his quiver. Could we perhaps say the same thing about Governor Carney? Potentially. Um, I mean, the thing about Mark Carney is that he, he came into much fanfare. Hmm. Everyone wanted him to do well. He seemed like this uh, savior of, of the economy. Hmm. He actually came in at a pretty good time because, of course, uh, Sir Mervyn King has actually seen out much of the worst um, from the UK economy. He certainly and, did. And, and it's hmm. a case of really just pushing us through into sort of quite significant growth and making sure that the country is stable somewhat. Hmm. That's exactly what he tried to do previously with his forward guidance and mm -hmm. try and give some sort of investment framework for, you know, for businesses, for banks and individuals alike, for everyone to be able to make investment decisions and going forward. Wrong. I don't think that it was necessarily convincing enough. I think hmm. he came out with, uh, you know, a, a time frame that wasn't a time frame. You know, hmm. it, it, he said 7% unemployment yes. and that in itself allows people to start thinking, all right, so perhaps, and he's just disclosed this, mm -hmm. perhaps it would take three years to get to 7%. Mm -hmm. So that gives some sort of time frame. Mm -hmm. And then he came out with this talk of 
a forward expectation of 2.5% or low of CPI yes. um, inflation. And should we be above that, so this forward expectation is within an 18-month time frame, mm -hmm. should they expect CPI to be above 2.5%, then that would somewhat invalidate the forward guidance that he's provided. Mm -hmm. Now, also bearing in mind that he's now come out and said that should the economy be suffering because of the interest rate decision, yes. then he'd be willing to step in and issue further quantitative easing. Mm. And so essentially he's taken a message that he's tried to be very clear to mm. the markets and he's diluted it massively. And that's why you haven't really seen see. the, the really big response that we're expecting in the markets. So it that. seems almost that your opinion is that really he seems to have weakened his mandate for price stability, the 2% target? Not necessarily. Um, I just think that he, he knew that he had to address the mm -hmm. mandate because mm -hmm. that is the primary mandate of the Bank of England, bearing in mind that you know, the Chancellor of Exchequer, at the, you know, when he announces the budget, yes. he, he discloses that the one target he wants the Bank of England to pursue is that 2% target. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you mentioned the fact that it's gone up to 2.5%, mm. which to some people was was notable because it somewhat undermined what hmm. they'd actually been told by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. But I guess he needed to find some way of actually, actually factoring in this price stability element into this forward guidance mm -hmm. without necessarily making it as rigid as having to reach 2%. Okay. Um, and so the idea that the forward expectations had to be 2.5% or below on an 18 to 24 month basis hmm. It, it makes it a, a lot more convoluted within the markets, but people don't know there's not an announcement to say 16 to 24 month uh, expectation. Mm -hmm. the, the core expectation is generally to the markets is this is what current CPI is or this is what last month's CPI is. Right. And so this allows for a lot more um, uncertainty in the markets. Mm -hmm. Do we know what the current expectation is in 24 months? Um, are they going to just see what they want to see if they, if, uh, sick, if, 16-month or 18-month expectation is at 2.4, yet 24-month expectation is at 2.7, which mm. one would they go on? So it some, right. somehow seems like it, it's, it's a little bit hard for people within the markets to actually gauge exactly how it's going to work. Okay, a uh, very complex situation, certainly. Yeah. Given that backdrop, cable. Where do we see cable, say, from here to year end? Where will it be trading in, say, three or four months' time? I mean, of course, we've seen this uh, significant upside in cable recently, mm -hmm. and everyone's wondering whether we're going to see some sort of significant breakout, and we, whether we're going to see further upside in the pair. But when you look at some of the factors that, you know, from a fundamental standpoint, are really, really playing into this, mm -hmm. you know, within the US, we have tapering, which is only yes. going to strengthen the dollar mm -hmm. going forward, and that, that's likely to happen sometime fairly soon. And also, mm -hmm. we have this crisis out in Syria, and that Generally, when you see, you know, if there's to, to be any sort of war or conflict, people do go to these safe haven assets. Mm -hmm. and the U.S. dollar is one of those. So that Certainly. will further strengthen the U.S. dollar. Hmm. So really what you've got is potentially an overbought currency pair with hmm. strength in sterling recently likely to be paired somewhat because of the tapering and also because of okay. conflict within Syria. Mm -hmm. And so where we are at the moment is around about 1.55. Yes. I do see the, the range within around about 1.48 to 1.56 being respected throughout to, to year end, really. I, I think we're going to see a bit of a downturn in the pair for the coming, coming period. Really. All right, perfect. Um, talking about perhaps overbought pairs, the single currency, and also talking about safe havens. Um, today there was an article in the FT, again, James McIntosh, saying that, single, that the single currency has gained a certain amount of safe haven status. Does that make sense? Where do we see the pair of trading? Again, also, three months out. I would say that, you know, the, the Euro's been having a pretty strong period, so mm. is the Eurozone. You know, there's no denying it. Some of the figures coming out, the PMIs, the GDP figures from some of the major co countries within the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. you know, it's been com pretty convincing and it's surprised a lot of people within the markets. Now, Part of that strength within the euro can be attributed to the fact that we've seen this flight out of the emerging markets. Okay. So where we've seen people moving their money out of the likes of India or places within Asia where they know they're going to get pretty significant returns. Hmm. They're coming back to some, some of these Western countries right. and looking to see where they actually can get significant returns. Hmm, hmm, some hmm. of that is likely to be the re real estate market within the likes of Spain, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of depressed uh, prices of 
a state within Certainly. the likes of Madrid, within Barcelona, that people are looking to put some money into. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that by buying property within some of these countries and with, within some of these key cities, that potentially they'd have to buy a lot more euros in order to complete that purchase. Okay. So I do think that that capital flight out of the emerging markets into the eurozone, into the UK and the US, really has propped up mainly the eurozone because of the fact that it does seem to be still quite depressed and quite cheap over there in the meanwhile. In mm -hmm. terms of the euro, mm -hmm. again, it's a similar kind of story to cable, really. Um, yeah, we've seen some pretty sig significant gains in the pair, and mm -hmm. we've actually seen a, a key trend line break to the upside, which makes it a lot more bullish. Yes. But again, you have to factor in the fact that we have tapering and the fact that we have potential Syrian conflict, and that would likely push the US dollar higher. And given that, again, we've got a, around about an overbought pair there is a high likeliness that we're going to see a return lower and you know by the year end we could see a return back to sort of 1.31 levels or something around that. Okay. Lastly, uh, one last question, uh, if you allow me please. Um, next week, non-farm payrolls in the United States. Um, what might be the range that we're talking about as far as estimates and above all, what impact will they have on expectations for Fed tapering in September? Do you believe there will be Fed tapering in September or not? Um, so, I mean, for me, I think uh, probably around about 190, 200 really for the non-farm okay. payrolls. Hmm. I mean, what's interesting is that recently we, we had a disappointing non-farm payrolls, but when you, you've got to look at some of the other figures that are actually coming out of the US for a little bit mm -hmm. more of an indication as to how the US economy is actually, you know, handling the current job mm -hmm. situation. You know, everyone wants to look towards non-farm payrolls. It is the big ticket item. It is right. the headline figure. Okay. But when we're looking at the unemployment rate, it's mm -hmm. fallen to, well, it's fallen and it's it, it, it's some, yeah, well, it's something that people are looking out for in terms of you know potential tapering. Hmm. And then when you look at some of the weekly claims, that's been on a, a downward trajectory. And so hmm. really, it's quite difficult to gauge whether they're going to be tapering in September. There's the potential that um, it may be a little bit too early for them. Okay. But we also have to bear in mind that going forward, the timeline for tapering has been for it to end around about mid to late 2014. I see. And okay. should they bring it in around about December or, hmm. or later, it doesn't give them a lot of time for them to actually um, you know, implement the whole of the reduction. Hmm. Now, the initial tapering is likely to be some, somewhat small, around about, about, about $10 billion maybe. Okay. And so, if they're going to reduce by $10 billion, say in December, hmm. then that potentially would give them six months for them to reduce the further $75 billion off of it, which doesn't seem like a very long period of time. So for mm -hmm. me, I think they'll want to try and start this as soon as possible. There could be a significant shot to the markets, which is probably what the Fed are worrying about. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they'd probably want to implement it sooner rather than later, so that if there is a shock, that they let it cool off somewhat before hmm. they actually start ramping it up uh, towards 2014 and onwards. Okay, I see. Well, Joshua, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. We do hope that you will join us again. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this is all the time that we have for today. But again, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with us. And for today, that's all from us here at Digital Look TV in London. Thank you very much for joining us once again.